Hello, and welcome back to Exploring Multimedia Art with P.D. Lork. I'm your host, Dr. Lawrence W. Moore. And in this episode, we are going to embark on a very interesting quest. We're going to look into P.D. Lork's version of data structures. Now, the term data structures may not sound intriguing, but what it is, is two-dimensional art that can be transformed in all sorts of ways. And the idea is for when you're working with audio or music, whether it's MIDI or digital audio, you can transfer data from the audio and the MIDI that you're doing to these data structures and have all sorts of different visual things happen. And um, this can be from creation of different shapes and pictures interaction with those pictures and it could also include animation of those pictures so we'll be exploring this for a couple of episodes here but i first want to basically kind of lay out the landscape for you basically show you some of the basic what are called scalars which are elements within data structures that you have to work with to make things they're almost like your different paint brushes and stuff that you can create art with. And so let's take a look at this. Okay, so I had PD Lork already open here. What I'm going to do is make a new patch file by going to File and New. This is going to basically be our sketch pad, so to speak, as we go through some of the examples. We are going to go through uh, some of the PD Lork examples. People using Peradata, I've seen in the help browser of Peradata. Um, a similar section of examples and since per data was kind of made from PD Lork um, it's quite understandable that that's the case so if we go to help and go to browser help browser we get this now let me just kind of like organize my windows here um, I want to keep this area over here pretty big. We won't need to see the PD window here so much, the console window. But as we go through these examples, some of them will pop up in their own windows. But I want to have a sketch pad area here just to explain them. So this PD Lork data structures is what we're looking for here. If you scroll down further, or actually it's probably up further, you just see data structures. Don't confuse the two. This data structures is the data structure component that is from Pure Data Vanilla itself, um, part of the core program. And um, while many of the same things can be done, it is a bit trickier and it is a little bit deeper. Um, so we're going to start here with the PD Lork data structures. Now, when you click on that, you have three different areas that you can browse. The demos, the tutorials, and then there's this one right here, Sprite Game. This is just a little game that you could play to try out just to see the depth of the interactivity. We're not going to go into this because I want to start from the basics so you understand what the elements are. And with the demos, a lot of these demos are beautiful and cool, but you have no idea what's going on until you start learning some of the basics. So tutorials is where to start, but I'm going to be adding a lot to this because the tutorials themselves are really like examples where if you go through them in order, you can build up an understanding of things but it's not until you really work with them, and as we work with them here, that you get to understand them. Now, the first section here um, says under construction. 
<laughs> um, but yeah, I opened that up and really what it looks like to me is showing like um, the different aspects of the language that are working and some of the things that are kind of working and it kind of like lists them out. This won't mean anything to you until um, you start playing with the different elements as we're going to do. But then you can go back and look at this later. Intro is the place to start. And um, although the intro example here is something that, wow, you just won't know how to do this until you start looking at some of the different elements that we're going to go through afterwards. But I turned up this volume slider here that they provide for you. I'm hitting bang. And there's where you can hear like some audio interacting with the uh, transformations of the letters here in welcome. And um, of course, you're more than welcome to read that on your own time and so forth. Kind of introducing you to what data structures are. Now, draw is one of the first commands we're going to learn, and it's one that we're going to use a lot. And this is basically showing you how the struct, S-T-R-U-C-T, -T, object, and then the draw object work in conjunction with one another. And um, we're going to start off by making a rectangle. So let me close this because this is where I'm going to pick up. But there you could see in that tutorial um, how the basics work. So I'm going to create an object, Control-1, Command-1 to Mac, um, struct, space, and then the thing that you put after struct, and you need to do this, is the name of your... I guess you could consider it your data structure, but you could have multiple elements within this. And as you get more and more used to this, you'll come up with, you know, more creative names and how you group different elements together. Now I'm saying the word elements there, but they're really called scalars. But for now, it's probably more understandable to people to call them elements. Um, like you group some together. Sometimes you want things on their own. We'll see as we go. But right now, I'm just going to call this, um, how about first? The main thing is it needs to be like other things that you name in pure data. Um, it is case sensitive, so if you ever need to refer to it, the case needs to match. It can't have spaces in it. Or basically, when you do a space after the word first, you're basically going on to the next um, creation argument in the struct object. And then this is what you need to put next float X and float Y. This basically has to do with how data structures work and function. All you need to write know right now is, is this is part of what you put in the struct object for it to work. Now we're going to start off with another object and this object is going to be draw and in the example their first example they draw a rectangle which is actually an abbreviation r-e-c-t that means draw a rectangle now we're going to put a series of coordinates the first two coordinates will be the x and y coordinates for length and height um, basically, X coordinates are horizontal, like this. Y coordinates are vertical. And since this is something that is going to be put into an object, um, basically you're saying what size in pixels is the object going to be. So, like, say, for example, we want 100 pixels wide. That means horizontally. 20 pixels tall. That is basically going to be the size and shape of our rectangle. Next, we put in the coordinates of what's called its origin. And different types of scalars, these elements that we're making, have different 
um, origins, or shall we say points of reference. Rectangles, it means the top left corner. Where's it going to be? Well, I'm going to say zero, zero, just for now. And then you'll have a better understanding of what this means once I make it. So now I'm going to make another object. And this is going to be the name of the structure, the data structure that we have here. I called it first. Boom. We got ourselves a rectangle. Now it's 100 by 20. So 100 pixels wide by 20 pixels tall. I could even reverse that right here and say 20 by 100. Just spaces in between these numbers, one single space. Then I click outside the object box and it changes it, changes it instantaneously. Now, a basic rule. When you're doing data structures, the struct object that you make looks for draw objects or other objects that refer to a data structure and all the ones that it finds on a given canvas meaning in this case think of it as a patch you know in this patch any of these things it finds here it will consider to be part of this for example we could make a second rectangle draw 20 by 100. Now, if I put 0, 0 again, the second rectangle will be sitting right on top of the first. Um, the origin that I was talking about before for the third and fourth uh, numbers here, that's the X and Y coordinates of the origin. And for rectangles, it's the upper left-hand corner, but it's really... No, um, but it's really saying where that upper left hand corner is going to be within the object. Remember, I made an object. Here, I'm going to make another. I made an object and I've typed in first the name of our data structure. This upper left hand corner of this object is the zero zero you know of the x y coordinates for this object and you see that's where it starts the upper left hand quarter of the rectangle now these are like regular objects you could select them like that by dragging over them press delete it's gone okay now what i was going to make next here before i went off on that was another rectangle Oh, no, I already started it right here. Draw 20, 100. You see, it didn't do anything. There's probably an error message in the console because I didn't finish it. I didn't give it a point of origin. But let's say we want to have another rectangle next to this one. Well, this one's 20 pixels wide. Let's give it 30 pixels worth of space there. And then start it. So we could type 30. Remember, is our horizontal axis X coordinate 30. And then zero because it'll still be in line vertically. So there we go. Um, this one is located at origin zero, zero. This one's located at origin 30, zero. Now this first origin, and as you see, here, let me select. Maybe it'll show it. You can see the outline here. This is all one object box being filled up with these rectangles. So the upper left hand corner of the object box is your origin zero, zero. If I want another rectangle, I can just select this, hit control D to duplicate, command D and Mac. Right now it's just put another rectangle right on top of the first. But what I'm gonna do is say, well, let's say we want one to the left of it. Since this is 0, 0, and this is 30, comma 0, although there's no commas in this, um, if I want to put 10 pixels to the left here, well, that would be 10 pixels plus an extra 20 for the 
width of the rectangle itself, we would say we'll start it at negative 30 and zero for the Y axis. Okay, so now you see all these are part of this data structure. You can only have one data structure per um, patch, but you can have sub patches. So let me do this. I'm going to hit control one. And as we make sub patches, remember it's PD space. We'll call this first. And now you see this patch window opened up. This patch is this one here. Now I need to hit control E, command E and Mac to get into edit mode. You know you're in edit mode when you see the hand and when you see the grid work behind. And there's a reason for that grid work because you'll maybe be working with these data structures a lot. Now let me take these. Well, actually, I'm just gonna take these. Control X, the object disappears because we got rid of its structure and the draw objects that tell it what to do. But as soon as I paste them back in, inside this patch, this sub patch, and here, I always like to clean up my sub patches a bit. You'll see that you can have now that data structure in its own sub patch out of the way. And uh, you could have a sub patch here then what this allows us to do is if we make another sub patch, we can make more data structures. You see what I mean? This is one data structure composed of three rectangles because any structure that you make, whatever objects relate to data structures will basically be part of this data structure. And you put them in sub patches or different patches, yeah, sub patches are probably the best way to do it. You put them in different sub patches so that they can associate with one another, and then you're free to make more data structures. Now, it, there's no prejudice on this as far as what other types of things you make. I could make a circle, for example. Now, it has a different creation arguments than rectangle. Draw. Look at this. I didn't even put in rect here. It looks like rectangle is default. But I'm going to put it in because that's just more correct to do so. Oh, come on. What did I do now? Uh, draw rect. This is 20 by 100. Negative 30, 0. Now we're back again. And then here, I just want to put the word rectangle in there. I totally did that by accident, but it looks like it will by default make a rectangle. Okay, so we are about to make a circle. Now it has different uh, um, creation arguments. And I'm gonna move this down a little bit. because I want to give it a little room. Now let's say we make a circle, draw circle. The first thing is its radius. And since it's a circle, specifically a circle, meaning from its center point to its outer circumference, it's one distance all the way around called its radius. You only need one number to really define its size. Let's say that's 20. And then you need to give its origin. Now for the circle, the origin is not the upper left corner. It doesn't have one. Uh, it's um, the center of the circle. So we could put that in as, um, let's just show you what happens when you do 0, 0. It appears right here. 
because remember this was our original zero zero origin and this was 30 pixels to the left horizontally so it's sitting right there looking kind of ugly let's move it over let's give it a different origin um okay um horizontally speaking since this is the line that's uh 30 pixels to the right let's go give it like a 10 pixel buffer and say well it's 20 pixels wide so that's a total of 50 plus 10 more for a little bit of space like a buffer so 60. if i put zero it'll be right there at the top well I didn't get as much buffer. Oh, we got to consider the radius of the circle. 60 plus the radius of the circle is 20. Let's change this number to 80. Okay. Now, if we want to look a little bit cooler, let's move this circle down a bit. What's about the halfway point? It's a 20 radius circle. And these are 100 pixels long. Um, I think 40 will get it somewhere in the middle. So I'm going to type in the y-axis of the origin, 40. So I'll be roughly in the middle. Just. I think 50 would actually be more exact 50 alrighty so there we go so you could basically make put as many you could draw as many scalars as you want within a data structure you just keep them within the same um, patch window is the best way of putting it okay so let's look at some of the next um things here it starts off with rectangle we've done that attributes now it's going to show us one of the main ways of giving something attributes like here it draws in their example a rectangle that's 50 by 50 in other words a square since the horizontal and vertical distance is the same and its origin is zero zero that would be right up here to the top upper left okay we all know that stuff that's just what we learned here data structure everything's the same the only things we'll be doing with um, the the object struct is just giving things different names so that we can have different data structures in the same patch Phil, you notice this is a message box, not an object box. Fill red, fill green. And it does exactly what you might think it would do. The fill is a command that basically allows you to change the attributes of a data structure. Or a scalar within the data structure, more accurately to say. We'll see later that there's a way that you could kind of group data structures so that the attributes you give them will apply to all of them. And then there's ways of doing it so that you could just do individual ones. Now, fill does accept some simple color terms. And these are all from HTML language. Red, green. I think there's such a thing as light green. Let me just test that. Yep. And some terms like that. Um, you could probably look up like uh, HTML color language stuff and find out all the different ones. I think it's like all the major color types. I know there's purple, um, yellow, and probably light yellow, dark yellow, light blue, dark blue. Um, I don't think there's mauve or anything like that, though. You know, these are kind of like basic, simple colors. 
or you can use RGB color codes, which we've actually worked with before in episode one, where basically fill is followed by three numbers to the RGB channels. And remember that's R, G, B. And so this one is green. This will define how green this is. Going from black, because these are zero and zero. Three zeros in a row means black, which is the default color. Um, and if you're gonna raise up the green channel, you're just gonna make it more and more green as you raise it up. But remember, it goes up to from zero to 255. Let's go halfway to 128. There you go. And 255. Full green, no other channels on. So that's another way to get all varying shades of colors. And since you can kind of like put in numbers like this, you could look up the numbers and keep them the same for all the objects that you want to have having the same color. So fill is one of the attributes you can give. Now, I'm closing this window, since I edited it a bit, it asked me if I want to save. No. Okay. Although I should probably save what I'm making. We're going to go to file, save as, and um, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to browse here. Documents, PD, episode two. This is what we made in episode one. I gave it a different name though. I'm going to talk about this later because we're going to use that. We're not going to change anything with it, but we're going to use it to impact some of the visuals we're making. I'm going to keep it simple at first, but I'll call this visuals just for now. This is all practice. So anyway, um, here we have our sub window still open here. So I can show you, you know, fill in, uh, in action. I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger here. Control 2 or Command 2 on Mac to give you a message box. Fill. And I'm going to use RGB numbers. How about 0 for red, 255, 255. That should give us kind of like a cyan or turquoise kind of color. Now, if I hook this up to one of these, it'll just do that one. I could hook it up to all four, and it would do all four. But the thing there also is we'll see later, there's another method of grouping your scalars so that... Um, it's an easier way of doing it rather than just hooking this up to all of them. That would work though. I could hook it up to all these and change them all, um, all their colors at the same time. Um, now that I disconnected that, if I were to retype this one again, like if I edited it or all, at all, or do nothing and click outside of it, oh, it didn't reset. A lot of times it will reset back to the default colors. But what they showed in the example there is that you can put in variables. And remember, in PD, that'll be like dollar sign one. If we're going to send in just one number, we'll just put in dollar sign one twice. If we're sending in two numbers, we use dollar sign two. But you got to do that through a packed message system. We'll see more of that later. Um, and then you put a number box. There, I could say I connected them up. And let's just do the circle. I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do... Control E to get out of edit mode. Remember, you got to be in run mode to interact with these things. There you go. So, 
there. You can see how to change colors on that. Alrighty, so fill, that's one attribute. Now we're gonna to go to an overview here of a number of attributes. It's called more attributes, and there's a bunch. So you can see there's a lot of things that you can do. This load bang means that to start opening this patch, it sent a fill red down here to this drawing of a rectangle, which you see appearing over here. Once again, it's just basically a square and um, it starts off red. Now here's a slider, depending on the kind of controls you want to have. This slider in its properties is set to a range of zero to one min and max range. So basically that means that it's left side when the slider's over there is at zero. And when you slide it over here, it's at one. What is zero to one doing? Well, let's follow it down here. It's going to this message, fill hyphen opacity, dollar sign one. So obviously an opacity of a scalar is basically how opaque it is. The opposite of opaque being transparent. So let's try that out here. Actually, it, okay, no, let's just make another message. Fill hyphen opacity. And then we'll say dollar sign one, which means receive a number coming in to replace this dollar sign one. And this will go with this one, which is our leftmost rectangle. You know, let's let's organize this a little bit. If you're taking classes with me, I'm expecting you to be putting these things together. Even though it's just practice, I really like you to put this together. Just so, you know, when you do it hands-on, that's when you really get to know it. You just watch someone do it. <laughs> you're not interacting with it yourself and getting to kind of like commit things to memory because I am going to allow for creativity later in this class where you'll be making some stuff and in order to be making some stuff you need to know what tools you have to make things so here this is going to be this left rectangle There we go. A number box is probably not the best way of doing it because when you slide through it, it goes by one. So we're already at negative 27 and that doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, the horizontal slider is a better way of doing it, but you got to set its range. So let's put the slider in. I think it's control shift J or command shift J in Mac. Pretty sure it is not. Um, so let's go to the put window and see. I know it is in PD vanilla. Um, H slider. It actually uses H instead of J. <laughs> it's like you would think. Horizontal slider, control shift H. So let's connect this up. And then we need to right click on the slider and go to its properties. The idea is to be zero to one. So we can en hit enter. We're not going to be sending symbols or anything like that. So we uh, could get fancy with it. There we go. And now oh, this is kind of covering it up. It's that third rectangle on the left that we'll be bringing in and out. There you go. You see, I'm here. No, I'm not. So you could literally have um, scalars there, these elements that are called scalars within a data structure. You could disappear them and then bring them back. And now let me do this. Just to show you, you can do this. You could put multiple attributes in a message. 
I'm going to say fill red. So that way, uh -huh, there we go. All righty. That middle one we just made green at one point, or actually it's the first one in the list here, but we can add a different attribute to it. Let's go back to our list here. So that's fill hyphen opacity is its own command. You also have fill rule. Now this is something we're going to pretty much skip over right now. Um, it deals with the rule of when the scales that you're making overlap, you know, like when the circle overlapped with um, the rectangle at one point. This would be defining a rule of what happens to them when they overlap. But I'm not exactly sure what the non-zero and the um, even odd thing really differs. I mean, I've tested this out myself. I didn't see a difference when I overlapped different things. So we're going to skip over this for now. Um, next we have here value of rounded edges. And there's X and Y definitions of that. So that's what we're going to try out over here with uh, one of these rectangles. Let me just make sure I get it. Yeah, it's RX, RY. So that's really what it is. So let me get back to our screen without closing this window. Eh. Here it is. Too many windows open. Okay, so let's start with this. Um, This rectangle we haven't done anything with yet. Or I did, but then disconnected it. Let's see what this rounded corners does. Now, I already kind of know, but it's something where you get a feel for it because there is an X and a Y to it. Obviously, what we're going to be doing, and, and it's this one here. This is the one here that we're going to be rounding. Um, basically... Yeah, I'm just making sure it is the right one. That's the one we're going to be rounding. But we also have another. Yeah, we're going to do this one. We'll do this one last. Um, we're going to round its corners. But the way the X rounding and the way the Y rounding work, it's hard to describe. You just kind of need to do it and play with it. So what I'm going to do is I made a message box. And <laughs> since that was selected, it put it up there. That'll happen to you a lot. Okay. So we're going to say RX, please. RX, dollar sign one, and then a comma. RX, dollar sign two. Now, in the example, it put them in, um, see, anytime your message box does that and you want to straighten it out, you could just hover over the edge and lengthen it. So this RX means rounding the x-axis of the corners, and RY means rounding the y-axis of the corners. Now, um, remember, we were, were able to do this separating them by commas. These are each individual attributes, and they can be sent by individual message boxes. If you want to send them in the same message box, you separate them by commas. And now I'm using a dollar sign one and a dollar sign two, so we could have two different numbers uh, for our X and Y attributes of rounding. Now what I'm going to put in here is whenever you're using two 
variables like that, two or more, they need to be received at the same time as a packed message. Now you make an object, type pack, F and F. The F stands for float, meaning a number is coming through. And since I put in two Fs, we have two inlets at the top for the two float numbers to come in. And what we're going to do is put a box, number box, control three. For one of them, this will be for the X, because that's the first variable. This will be variable one. I'm sorry, I point in the wrong place. Right here, RX dollar sign one, RX dollar sign two, right here. Okay. Then um, we need to hook this up. Actually, we're going to put in one more thing. The way we want this to work, and yeah, I need more vertical space, so I'm going to be moving some things down. Let's move you down. Sorry about this. It's just about housekeeping. Okay. Move you down a bit to there. All right. What I wanted was a little extra space here because for this to work conveniently, the way packed functions is if it receives a number through its left inlet, its first inlet, it'll send that number through with whatever number is stored in its right inlet. If we hadn't sent in a number at all, it would just send out a zero because there's nothing there yet. Now, when you put a number in the right inlet, it sits in there and stores it and waits until a number comes through the F -lit inlet and then they both go out as a packed message. We want this to work such that we could change a number in either number box and have it sent no matter what. And the way we do that is with an object called a trigger, bang, float. Now what this means is when the number comes in here, it triggers two things to happen. The float, meaning that number that came in, will go into here, and the bang will go here. So now... Uh, please. There we go. So now, when we put a number in either of these boxes, it'll do it. And this message will get sent here to the draw. And draw that rectangle. And I believe the one it's going to do is this one right here. So we got to watch a little closely as we turn up the X there. Turn it up to 64. Hmm, I'm not seeing much. I think there's something wrong. Hold on a second here. Going into pack. Your bank flight going into pack here. What if I need to do Y? Let me try Y. Okay, there, we definitely see something. You see, as the number goes up, it goes like that. What happens if we go into negative values? Uh, it doesn't do anything. So you got to send the positive numbers. You can really turn it almost into an ellipse. Now that is... Oh, oh, this is supposed to be RY. I had a typo here. Okay, now I know why RX wasn't doing anything. 
it was receiving two different numbers. It was being two different attributes was being set. Rx actually having a value and Rx actually staying zero. Okay, so here we go. Rx is this one. Still not doing anything. Ry does something. Why is Rx not doing anything? That is quite strange. Put it at zero. Let's put it at 50. I'm going to try something separate here. Let's just make a separate message. Because as long as I don't move these, nothing's being sent there. Let's try Rx 40. Oh, no. Come on. Put it in here. There we go. No. No. Denied. Now, I'm wondering if it maybe is doing a little something, but because that rectangle is so... Like, let's look over here. Um, Rx is this one. Well, its opacity is down. We need to bring that back. See, Rx is curving it here. Look at this. Now, the reason why these can be dollar sign ones is they're in separate messages. Maybe they need to really be in separate message boxes. Now, let me do this, because one thing I'm realizing is when you're using pack, both are being sent at once. But if the one number is staying the same, it should still be happening. This RX50 should look like something. I wonder if it has something to do with the fact that this is so narrow. Let's make it wider. That circle's going to have to move over then. Um, 20 by 100. Let's make it... 50. I don't know. This something just doesn't seem right there. That way, that way we need, need to move this circle over if we still want to see it by 30 more pixels. So change its first X value. No, its origin value. Add 30 to it. So that's 110. There we go. So now it's a little bit wider. Maybe the X... That does not make sense. Yeah, let me try something else here. I'm going to get rid of pack. And I'm going to make Rx and Ry the same number. So both are going to change at the same time. Okay, let's go to zero. Yeah, now we're doing it. There we go. So the X and the Y, it's kind of hard to perceive. It's almost like, okay, we rounded these corners here. How much are we rounding off 
horizontally to make this horizontal slope. Whereas how much we're rounding off vertically to kind of like do a similar thing. Um, let me just make it Rx. And then make it Ry just so we can kind of see. I don't want to labor this point too much because it is just like one attribute. Uh, but it bugs me that we go back to zero, we're at zero. Now let's go at like 40. Yeah, see, Rx, when, when I'm defining it on its own, does something. Now let's see what happens if we go back to zero here. And what I'm going to do, shrink this down, copy it, and make it an RY to see what the difference is. I have a feeling we're not going to see much of a difference. But that is interesting to know that I couldn't use RX and RY in a double message. I was able to use a double message here with Phil and uh, Phil Opacity. But let's try this. Try put 50 here. Okay, now remember that shape. Try put 50 here. It does look a little different. Although it seemed to reset there. Look at that, when we go to one, seems to almost undo what X was doing. So it looks like they, there is a little interference between the two, I guess, depending on what you're doing. Let's try. Let's just do this. Let's send this over here how does it look when our rx and our ry are the same so zero means rectangle let's go to 50. yeah it looks even both ways i might do something like that where basically your rx and ry are the same i'm not going to keep laboring this what's the difference between the you know, the rounding um, with the X or rounding with the Y. But it looks like um, keep them the same is probably a good rule of thumb or just use one or the other. Because all it says here is X value for rounded rectangle corners, Y value for rounded rectangle corners. Uh, okay, so anyway... <laughs> Now, here's another thing. There's an aspect to these uh, scalars called stroke, which is basically it's outside, almost like a border going around the outside. So we're going to try some of these. Um, stroke purple. And... Um, let me get this back and stroke 10. Okay, let's send a message. That's an object box, won't work. Control two, message. We're going to say stroke, and we could just say red. Now, this is going to affect this rectangle here. And then you could also send the message stroke hyphen width, saying how wide it's going to be. Let's say five pixels. Otherwise, I think it defaults to one pixel width. Boom. Now let's see, let's change that to 
2. There we go. So we got ourselves a stroke around the rectangle. Circles also have the ability to be stroked. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here's our circle. We'll just add to this fill command here. We'll put a comma, stroke, um, yellow, comma, stroke, hyphen, width. Did I do a typo in there? Comma, stroke, yellow. I'm pretty sure yellow is an acceptable color. Stroke hyphen width. Ooh. Circles don't have strokes. Yeah, I'm going to try and make this a little bit simpler here. Okay, so I had a typo in that. Let's just put stroke red around it, see if we get that. Yeah, we did. Oh, I know what. Jeez. Oh, no, it was probably working before. I was looking at this thing. I was looking at this monstrosity that we made here, thinking that was a circle, <laughs> even though it isn't. Okay, so we're going to basically... Save that, and um, we'll make a new data structure for other stuff. So anyway, you could see how these attributes work. And you can see how they're changeable. Although one thing I'd like to point out is in the objects, the draw objects, these are not changeable. There will be some drawing scalers. I should say, you know, scalers. But basically, there are some scalers where their coordinate things can be changed. The ones we have covered so far do not have that. But it's not changed in the object. You know how I've been putting dollar sign one in messages to receive number box information, to uh, change characteristics, to change attributes? You cannot do that with the draw object itself. It does not accept a dollar sign one. Well, it may, but it won't do anything. It just won't happen. You got to do these changes. The real time changes come through uh, messages. But as we go on, we'll see what messages can do what. Um, <laughs> there is a, a stroke option. Here, let's do our stroke purple, stroke width 10. There is a stroke option to make a dash array, which is a series of lines instead of a solid stroke around it. And what you need to put behind it when you do that is basically how many per side... Um, Five, ten. I guess that what it means is it makes it dashes that are ten wide and five long. I believe. And so the smaller there are, the more of them there could be possibly. I haven't worked with those a lot. Haven't found them super attractive enough to do so. But um, that does exist, so it's good to be aware of it. Those dotted line boxes that you've seen before, that's what those are. Um, like in the welcome message there. And then we have stroke line cap. 
this looks for, in this case, it's being sent to a rectangle, but it looks for lines. And if it finds lines, which these strokes in the dash array are, it will kind of like change the attribute for how it's capped. Zero equals miter, like a miter blade, I guess. One is round, two is bevel. Um, let's just put in one to see what a round cap looks like. Now, this only affects lines, or in this case, since these strokes are lines, it does affect them. So, I didn't see them get rounded. Uh, let me see here. Line cap zero. Oh, I typed the thing in here, and I typed it into the wrong one, in other words. One is a rounded line cap. Type it into the right message and send the right message. And there you see they're rounded now. Okay, and then here you have the, the stroke line join, and it has some options here. It's like the shape of path, path corners. In this case, the dash array is considered a path. The shape of its corners could be miter, rounded, or bevel. Um, we've rounded the edges of it. I think it's talking about quarters going around the side. But let me do this. Let me put it back to a, uh, a zero here for the line cap so we can see what happens with that. Okay. And then... Now that we've done that with that, let's see the line join. Well, I guess it doesn't do a lot because they aren't really joined at this point. Let's put this back to being rounded. And then put this to be joined. So yeah, I guess it looks a little bit rounded around the corners a little bit more so. In fact, the reason why it probably doesn't look much different is I had already sent this. Okay, so we're kind of like looking at some of the details here. Um, let me just see if there's any more um, important to look at here. There's the stroke, line caps, line join. Um, and you won't see this do anything like if you apply it to a circle or something unless you had the dash array there or you applied it to a line as its own individual scalar, which we are going to be seeing soon. Uh, and then there's this miter limit. Limit miter length. Well... I don't think we put miters on here. Let's try a miter here on this to see how that shape looks around this dash array. Okay, yeah, they do look a little bit more bulbous and stuff. I mean, that is something to play with um, probably best when you're actually dealing with a line object, which is coming up next. And here we already know what, uh, oh, you can control the opacity of the stroke itself. That should have made it lighter. There you go. So, I mean, there's a lot of different attributes and commands. Now here, transform. Transform is an attribute that is followed by another. It's more like a command followed by attributes that you can change. Like here, this will skew it. Transforming it through skewing it. There we go. Um, so you can see, they put a little math on that to make sure that, you know, cutting your values in half so it doesn't go too crazy. 
So you see it's skewing the image and how it how it slants. There is a skew X and a skew Y. Skew X is horizontal and Y is vertical. All right, so we're seeing some of the things that we can do here with these um, these things. And probably what I am going to do is go to saving attributes. This is real simple. Um, you can have a load bang and bang a message of attributes to something. And that's the way it'll be. If I were to close this, none of this will be saved the way it is. Okay, it, it, and, and let me just show you what things would have to be changed. First of all, you would need a load bang to hit the messages to be sent. And those messages that have numbers here, those numbers need to be sent. So let me show you how you would save this. If you did this exactly and you wanted to. Control one, make an object, load bang. If we just bang this message, it'll send stroke red, it'll send stroke width to no problem. Now, if we take the same load bang, we could take another patch cable out of it. Number boxes zero out when you open up patches. The number doesn't get saved. So if I wanted to save this the way it is, I'm going to move it back over here and do it like this. I need to make a message with the number I want in it because message boxes do not change. When you save it and you open again, 50 will still be there. All right. Now, um, this guy is going to start at zero when the thing opens. Sliders always revert to their minimum value. And since that is controlling the opacity of this, if you wanted something to be disappeared when you start up, you're fine. But if you don't, or let's say you want it half opacity, let's do that. Let's make a message. I just hit control W instead of control E or whatever I was trying to control two is what I wanted to do. Control two. Let's say we want this to have half opacity to start. 0 0.5. Remember the range is zero to one for fill opacity. Okay, now over here, number boxes zero out. When they start up, this would work. It just needs to be banged. And this needs to receive its number if we wanted to give it a number. Um, let's just make it 128. All right, hook it up to here. So that means that, uh, you know, uh, a half green, or what do we have here? We have two dollar sign ones. That means that green and blue, kind of like a turquoise at half strength would come through. Now I'm trying to get one more low bang thing here. You could use sends and receives for this so it doesn't look as ugly. Putting these patch cables all over the place. Here's where I wanted to go for this message. So, that means, let me just hit this. Let me hit this. 
and uh, hit this, and I close it. This is how it should look when it opens again. I'm going to close it. I did hit Control S to save it. And then we open it again. And that's how it looks. Maybe the stroke here, I didn't do anything about. Let's open that up. Or no, I did make that a thinner stroke. I remember that now. So yeah, all the values were saved. Okay, I'm still going to look through more of the attributes here just to see where a good stopping point would be. Um, I planned on spending two weeks on this, but I'm thinking what will be good in this episode here. Yeah, SVGA line circle. They didn't even get to circle yet in ellipse. And a polyline path transform. Let's go to transform here next and look at the different transforms because I want to kind of like take in an audio object that we made last time and actually have it do something. Basically, this, yeah. It, it does look a little bit daunting at first, but let me just kind of show you how to read it. We're drawing a rectangle, basically. And that's down here. It has a transform here where the command being sent is matrix. Well, that's something I actually haven't worked with yet, and I've been through a lot of these. Oh, the matrix values. We haven't covered matrix. There's simpler transform stuff in, um, without having to cover matrix first. So I'm just going to do that on my own, just like I did with circle um, and line. Here, I'm just going to cover these two next, and then we're going to make something. And next time, we'll pick up at... We'll pick up at uh, 10. Okay, so we already been through all these attributes, saving attributes. Now line, let's just see how this works. Now think about a line. As you see, we have a structure here. Um, and, it's, and one of the things in the structure is, is a line which is down here. Draw line 0, 0, 100, 100. So obviously it has different attributes or they're really in a different order. You know how rectangle is its horizontal length by its vertical height and then it's um, the origin. The line starts with an origin and then gives you the coordinates of where the line goes to. Okay. Now, here's the thing. As you see this stroke going right into it, this is something that can be altered afterwards, but there's a stroke here that's being load banged into it. It's basically saying stroke it blue and stroke with 25. Well, let me just show you. Let's make the stroke width one. Just to explain it. You see the line, this is really about two pixels wide because it's being stroked on one side and the other. Basically a line isn't a filled space or can't even be filled as a space. It is basically coordinates for a stroke. So you need the stroke to see it. And then, of course, here is where you can change colors of it. They've set that up using the methods that we already know. What the heck? Oh. No, this is not colors. What am I doing? Man. No, this is um, 
basically saying it's line cap. We need to make it bigger to see that. Now we can finally see what those line caps look like. But let's put its width back to 25. So these are just numbers. Like when you say line cap, it's expecting a number behind it and it could be zero, one or two. But ends means basically, you know, rectangular. Rounded, it curves the ends of the stroke lines that make the line as rounded. And then square, I don't know, that looks to be about the same as butt. Oh, square basically does add to it. It makes it longer. Just like rounded makes it longer, but means nothing there. Like there is no end to the line. There is no line cap, in other words. So there could be no line cap or it could be rounded. And so this same thing applies to the line cap that we saw on the dash arrays that we were seeing before. So I'm going to close this. That's how the line works. Um, but we should make it just to get it down. Let's do this. Control one, PD second, kind of like the second chapter in this quest. Now what we're going to do is make a struct, second, float X and float Y. Okay, and then we're gonna draw line now see here it has an origin zero zero and we'll make this 200 200 now let's place this object second but I don't think you're going to see anything Now we see the outline box of the object. I need to get this out of the way to get that out of the way. So we see the outline box of the object, but we don't see the line. And in fact, if we click off of it, it's like there's nothing there. So, and I'll just show you just as an example and say, well, what about fill red? Hit it, nothing happens. Nothing there. So let's try this. Stroke red, stroke width um, five. And send the message. There we go. So obviously zero, zero is up here as the origin coordinates and it goes down there. So we've just made a line. Now let me see if this line allows you to draw further. I don't think so. We went down to 200, 200. Let's see if we could go over to 200, 100, 100. Um, yeah, let's keep the X at 200 and the height at zero. Let's see if it curves back up again. No. It just accepted the new coordinates. So instead of having the line here and then going back up, you can only do one line. So that's a line, but fortunately, there is a thing called polyline. Now you could just draw a bunch of line segments and then have them connect like what I wanted to do there. Of course, we want the same message to go to it or else we won't see it. But I was just going to draw another line to it. Uh, 
uh, let's see, 0, 200. Hit this. And see, there you go. So you have to put them in separate draws in order to connect up these lines, and then you got to send them the same message for them to appear. Well, there's another way of doing that. In fact, I'm just going to delete this. We have polyline. Which is an object like this. Draw polyline. Start at the origin 0, 0. Let's go horizontally over 100. And don't change our vertical. Basically, this is all in um, kind of like relationship to where that 0, 0 origin is. If we go basically to the right 100 horizontally, 0 vertically, and then we go down to the coordinate 50 horizontally and 50 vertically, and then we go back to 0, 0, we should get a triangle. Now that's what polyline does. If you make a closed and enclosed uh, entity, it will fill. Okay, so it's not just made of strokes. It will fill. You can add strokes to it. Stroke blue, stroke width two. Now, if you don't enclose it, <laughs> did that work? It's hard for me to see that stroke there. Stroke blue, stroke width. Let's make the width wider. Maybe it's just too narrow for me to see too well right now. Yeah, there it is. I see it. Although yellow would show up better. Remember, I could be putting in RGB numbers there as well. There. Yeah. We're good. We see it. Now, what happens if I take out that last line segment, which means it's no longer fillable? Well, it took out the stroke. Let's send it again. Okay, the stroke's there. It took out the last line segment, so it's no longer enclosed, but it stayed filled. That weird. <laughs> well, let's say you wanted to draw and not have to deal with seeing any of that kind of filled stuff. I have a feeling that you could just put a comma on here and go fill hyphen opacity zero now send it there we go we just see our yellow line so you can basically make draw line segments now there's a nut there's other ways of doing this there is the path command for drawing these different types of line segments as well as curved segments which is powerful but let's um let's get rid of this because that just doesn't look good I'm just showing you like all these different things that you can do and it's uh, up to your imagination and let's add the zero zero back here 
Okay. Now, the thing is, you could achieve the same thing with um, polygons. And in fact, I'm wondering, with the commands that you put in, if there's a huge difference between them. Um, so circle, ellipse, we'll finish with ellipse, but uh, I said we we're going to start with that next time, but I just did polyline. We might as well do polygon. So we'll start with path next time. Path um, is where we'll start, uh, but I'm going to do ellipse and polygon now, and then also make something. All right, so here, it's made these polygons where you draw the polygon and you basically give starting coordinates where you're drawing a line segment to next, where you're drawing a line segment to next, and next, and next, and next, and next, and so forth. All right, so let's play with this and see how much different this is from polyline. Now here, they're also showing, putting some transforms into here, like translate. This is powerful. This allows you to actually move things. You can fill things. Well, that's a com different command, but trans, um, transform has translate as one of its commands, basically allowing you to move these things around. So we're really going to be able to get into, um, what do you call it, uh, animation, 2D animation. Let me open this up here and look at, um, how polygon compares to polyline. Draw polygon zero zero now let's go over a hundred horizontally and zero vertically now I didn't expect anything to appear because nothing would really be enclosed can we see a stroke on it though stroke blue uh, let's do red and uh, stroke width five so let's see so yeah it's looking a lot like polyline now let me do this I'm going to go to the coordinate 100 by, let's say, 20. Ah, and it already tried to fill it in. It already is filling it in. Let's hit this to see the stroke. Oh, and it's even completing it. So I didn't, yeah. I didn't even complete the segment I was trying to do. I wanted to go down here, and then I'm going to go over a little bit. Kind of like make a truck shape. 120, 20. Let's see what it does there. Yeah, it has gone over a little bit, but it's trying to complete itself. So that's uh, one of the differences. It's trying to complete itself. And then here, we're going to go down to 120, 100. Uh-huh. Although 100 is a little bit deep. Let's do 50 again. All right, and then I'm going to go back now. Let's say we're going to change this into being like a truck shape and have it go back to here. That is zero horizontally at X axis and the Y axis, it would be 50. Okay, it did it. 
So it's really working with you along the way to try to fill things in. You want to make a bus? Add two circles here and there. So there's the polygon. The poly line doesn't necessarily fill in. Like each time I change it, since I change it, I have to hit this message again to get the stroke back. But there you go. But the poly line doesn't seem to strive to complete the thing unless you obviously do get to the end and really complete it. So that seems to be their difference. Now, there's something special about these because these things can be changed later. Now, let me show you uh, ellipse and then transform. Uh, we'll add ellipses to this little figure here. But the way ellipses work is basically you're drawing something that has curves, but it's not exactly a circle. It would be like 360 degrees, but it would have two foci in the middle. Although you don't need to worry about those so much, you pretty much put in a left to right and an origin, and it'll just round it off rather than being a rectangle. Okay, so let's imagine here this is about 20 in. Um, going to have the same message go to this. Uh, but it's 50 pixels down. So draw ellipse. Twenty, fifty, and then it's and then afterwards you put its origin points. So this could be moved all over the place unless I get the exact origin, which really would be zero and zero. I'm calculating all this off of those, and I just put this in a message box, which means it ain't going to do anything. Um, let's make an object box. I just copied and pasted that, that's all. All right. So we, did we get our ellipse? Draw ellipse 20, 50, 0, 0. Let's hit it with the stroke so we can see where it is. Uh oh. I did something wrong. 20 by 50 should be somewhere around here compared to the origin 00. zero. Let's go back and look at this. Oh, come on. Did I close that? Yeah, I bet I did. Let's go here and look at this ellipse description. Uh, ellipse. This looks like 80 and 40. Oh, I know what I did wrong. I know what I did wrong. That's its size, it's first. Let's make it 30 by 40. 30. Or 20. 40. This means it should be vertically stretched. And the location now are those magic coordinates 20 by 50. Let's hit it with a stroke to see if we can see it. Well, I know I did fix something because that was wrong what I did before. E-L-I-P-S-E. -E. Did I close that again? 
I close my help file again. Not the way you want to do it. Not the way you want to do it. They're sending it a fill yellow stroke blue. You shouldn't have to fill it though. And the stroke width. Yeah. Yeah, pretty straightforward. How about I fill it with a color, see if we can find it. Because it could be sitting somewhere in here, but the stroke should be able to be seen around it. Fill. See if we can see it. And I'm looking up here. I don't see it appearing up here. This is not it. This is a rounded corner thing we made before. Let me see if there's something that can help in the console window here. Always a good idea to check. Warning. Draw. No shape specified. No shape specified. Did I spell ellipse wrong? Have you been sitting here telling me this whole time that, uh, hey buddy, you spelled ellipse wrong? E-L-I-P-S-E. -E. And over here, there's two. There's two frappin' L's in the word ellipse. Ah! Now we got our wheels on the bus going round and round. Here. Get this out of here. We will go over here. Now, ellipses are not good wheels, but you can at least see. <laughs> They're not good wheels. Um... Here, let's send it to saying stroke message so we can see the outline of them. Yeah, that's not a good wheel. Um, <laughs> we can make it look like flattish tires here. Hold on here. Uh, let's go with like a fifteen ten kind of vibe. Then I have to update that message again. There we go. And now let's put another one in. Where do you think it'll work? Um, draw. Oh, come on. Ellipse. 15. Ten. Um, somewhere around ninety. <laughs> That's way off. Um, <laughs> oh, well, I don't have a second coordinate here. Um, ninety fifty. There we go. Stroke it. There we go. We got a bus. <laughs> awesome beans. Okay, so now let's see if we're going to be finishing this off in like 10 minutes. I know folks say these get a little bit long, but hey, these are college level classes and on ground, they're four hours. And for those of you who are my non-students, 
that are willing learners and participants. Thank you for joining me, but you wouldn't be here unless you wanted to be. Okay, now let me see here. Remember that thing called translate that we saw before? We're going to use that. But after looking at one more thing here, that'll make this easier. Remember how I told you way back in the beginning, way back in the beginning of this adventure that we went on today, that there was a way to group things together. I think SVG may have it, but animation, events, Grouping. How about that? Okay. You can take things and put them in a draw G, which is a group. And then you can send transforms to everything in that group. Let's open it up. All right, and now the way it works, we have a load bang within this group giving it initial values, which is fine, which is fine. All this I can paste into my draw G, and then outside I'm going to put transform. I'm going to leave that there just in case. Let's open this up, the sub pack. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave um, struct here because this is technically a group, not a new sub patch. It's kind of like a sub patch, but not draw G or at least this says anything you put into it still goes with the struct in the sub patch. Okay, I just pasted them. There we go. Now, if I just put a load bang on this, this is the only attributes I need for this to start off the way it looks now. So that's good. Let's close that. Now, let's say we want this to move, but all together. We have our draw G here. We're going to use transform. Now this we haven't gone over a lot yet. We've seen it a little bit, but we're going to do a little bit more with it. Transform. And then there's translate, which means move. X and Y. X will be dollar sign one. Y will be zero because this is a bus moving along the ground. And then we're going to put a number sign here. Well, let's see what happens. At least now I can shrink this. Ah, just let it go. Uh, let's see here. Uh-huh. 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 Okay, so this is the point where we're going to get to the assignment. Those of you who are in classes with me I do want you to submit this um, patch that I'm about to make now. And if you were following along doing all this stuff with me, great. You're going to be much more comfortable with this. And in fact, anybody that skips to this point in the video is not going to see inside this sub patch. Okay. 
And they're going to be having a much harder time when I say, okay, I'd like you to make a visualizer. Be creative with it. You have your options of what you want to do, but here's some parameters for you. They haven't been following along. They don't know how to make a rectangle. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Nope, 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 nope. It's not going to be good. Some people are going to be watching a lot of hours of last minute videos. But those of you who've been joining me, I appreciate you. Thank you very much. I do a lot of time in prepping these things. And we're going to have some great stuff that we're going to make. As I'm going to show you right now. Now, I'm going to go to File. Save As. If there is a folder where you were keeping what we did last time, great. You don't have to rename it, but I think it's a good idea because that's what this thing is. It's really an audio input that we made last time. It is mono, and it does take in from the left channel. So wherever folder you have that in, put this in. We're going to call it bus. Okay. Now that we've saved that in this folder... And since I made this new patch under the same console window that we've been having open PD Lork here, I can copy and paste from here. So I am going to copy and paste this over. Control C. Control V. You can drag around and click where you want it. Now I'm closing this. I'm going to save it though, just for the hell of it. Now, I can load this as an abstraction into here, so long as they are in the same file folder. All I have to do is make a, where'd that object go? Hold on here. PD second. I could stand to have some renaming. Let's call it PD bus, but let's get our bus back. Bus. I'm going to go to open. And um, we're calling it second here. Let's call it bus. Now I'm going to make the bus object again, bus, <laughs> oh, why are we not getting it? All the information's here. Now this struct is not in the same group as this stuff here. Let me try that. Open. It's not how their example showed it. In their example, the struct was on the outside. Okay. Boom. Close that. Well, the transform could affect it too, but no, this didn't light up. This didn't light up. Bus. Okay, I am going to pause the video and troubleshoot this in case you had the same problem. Actually, no, what I'm going to do is this. Close you. I'm just going to take the visualizations thing that we made. I'm going to rename it to bus. Now remember, this is in the same folder with our audio input from last time. Okay. I'm just going to delete these because we're not going to use those. It's good practice. Sometimes you got to let it go. All right. There we go.
Now I'm going to bring this in. Since they're in the same folder, this is saved here to this file name. I can type an object box audio underscore input underscore mono underscore L, and that's a capital L followed by a tilde. Audio underscore input underscore mono underscore capital L tilde. What did I get wrong? What did I get wrong? Or did we not? We did not give it a canvas. Oh boy. All right, so we got to open this and we got to give it a display on parent. Now, what size is this? We can easily find out right here because we did graph on parent from the inside. Properties. 280 by 160. Well, you know what we can do? Select all. Control X, Control close this, go to here, get rid of this empty object now, Control V to paste everything in, and I'm going to line it up like that. You can Control A to select it and move it around. Basically, we are going to make it graph on parent again. We were graphing it on parent to hide its oh, to hide its insides last time, but this time we're gonna oh will you please stop fighting me. It keeps wanting to move up. Here. I want you to move down one, or a few even, just down because I want this all on screen. Control A. Control. Why aren't you doing it? Control A should select all, grab something, and move it. And then it pops it right back up again. All right, I'm gonna save, close, and reopen. Control A to select all, click and drag. No, Control A, select all, and then click and drag something that doesn't reshape itself. Oh, you keep poking back up. All right, it let me do that. That's good enough. So now we're going to graph on parent again. We're 20 pixels in, we're 30 pixels in this way. Go, right click on space, go to properties, go to graph on parent. I think it's 280 by 360. No, it definitely would be the opposite if that were true. 360, it's wider than it is high. And uh, just like we did last time, we're going to hide Oh, hide scroll bar, sure. Although I don't think we'd get any. Hide name on the parent. Okay, apply. Now, we see the red box here for graphing on parent. We need to tell it its point of origin is um, 20 by 30 and that you do X offset 20 Y offset 30 
Okay, but it's too big. We could find out just by going up here to the canvas that we have for the background. Right click on it and go to um, properties, see how big it is. Width 280. Height 160. Alrighty, so we can do that. But I don't edit any of these issues out because you know what? You're going to get them too. And getting experience of how to deal with issues always helps. So now, this no longer has a sub patch. This is the parent patch. But I put a graph on parent square around our viewable area. So now, hit save. Let's go back to the thing where we're loading it. It's already filled it in. So let me just do that again just to show you. This patch is this file here, bus.pd. It's in the same folder as audio input, blah, blah, blah. So we can make an object and it'll look for it. Audio underscore input underscore mono underscore left tilde. The tilde I add to it because it is an audio device and it's good for people to know that it is an audio device so there it is here's our bus now this is what i'm going to do all right we're going to right click on here open it up so we're opening up our audio patch and any edits we make here we can save and it will save it to its own file as long as this window's open. So what I want to do here is I'm going to take some audio signal. Here is the audio signal after the gain knob. I'm going to access that. I'm just going to drag these down so it looks nice. We have an outlet for our audio to go out to hook this up to other audio modules as we will in the future in the series uh, as we make more stuff but we also want to get some numbers out of here now audio signal itself those numbers aren't going to work with the numbers for message boxes and sending information to um, the stuff that we've been making here with the data structures so we got to change them. We got to say, okay, you sample rate flying numbers, you're going to be unsigged. U N S I G tilde. Oh, it was. It was an object and other stuff. Hold on here. Sig tilde. Right click properties or help. It should show somewhere in here that there is an alternate. They typically do. But they didn't in this help file. Oh, we can still complete this another way. But I am almost certain there is. Unsig. Maybe you don't put the tilde after it. No. Nope. I'm going to pause this a second. Just one moment. Okay. Perhaps the whole unsig thing was something I dreamt. Um, but basically, we can use env tilde. Um, this stands for envelope. Uh, but I type it right, ENV. But what it really is is an amplitude oh, ENV tilde, an amplitude monitor where it takes in audio rate signals like this. And it can output for us what it would be. 
as a regular control rate, floating point, stream of numbers rate sort of thing. So let's just test this and see. So you can see what's happening. Okay, is our audio on? Should be, low bang hit this. But our gain is down. So we turn up our gain and we're talking and signals coming in. We could even display it on this table here, I think. What's going on? You doing it? You doing it? Hello? Hello? <laughs> Why is it not doing it? Why is it not doing it? ADC. I didn't change anything since last time, and it was working last time. I've corrected I don't know how many this week. Gain, send. The send should not have changed from here. Yeah. Um, okay. I think maybe everything needs a, a closing and a reopening is what I'm sensing. Because I did open PD Vanilla in between. So I'm going to close that. Let's close um, PD Lork. I was jumping over to PD Vanilla while paused. Let's open Bus PD. It has our thing in here. Let's see here. Let's turn up our gain. Turn this on. Yep, we got sound. That's what it was. I just need to reopen. And so now we see our envelope here giving us a stream of numbers. And... Um, well, it's giving us numbers in a pretty, pretty uh, crazy range there. It looks like, um, this looks like it's DB. So I'm going to put something afterwards. DB to RMS. And then let's put a number box there we go now we're in a range of zero to one all right so now let's see how this works this stuff is flooding in pretty fast we might actually want to slow this down a little bit emv has some sort of uh what do you call it um control i'm um, creation arguments you could put in first is window size this is the size in um, it's, it's the size of the area that it scans as things come in. Uh, basically, it's bringing in amplitude number, the stream of samples, and this is the size of area it scans. By default, it's 1024. I'm going to make it bigger than that, like 2048. And then after this, you could say, this is like the, the time interval in scanning this. I'm going to make it 48,000 because that's my sampling rate. And so now we're getting an analysis every second, basically. And all right, that might be a little slow. Let's try 2,400. Or you know what you can do here? You can do this, create an object, because maybe you're using a different sample rate. Sample rate. That outputs your sample rate. Have load bang hit that to start. We may want to hit it now, so let's just make a bang here. But to open up, load bang will hit this. And it will hit sampling rate. And it'll give us that at the beginning. All right. Now let's just multiply. Let's cut that in half. Star. 
0 0.5. And we'll have that. Oh, there's no in. There's no inlet for it here. I have a feeling though, you just send it in through the left inlet, but I'm gonna send it in with this a message box. 20, 48, dollar sign one. The dollar sign one, the variable, basically is what our, half our sampling rate's gonna be. So basically, Twice a second, this will get calculated. But we're sending in both these numbers because those are the creation arguments. That should work. <laughs> you know, whenever you don't have a, a separate inlet for your creation arguments, although I'll make this 24,000, you know, that's what you get. So let me hit this. And let's see how fast this is changing. It's not that fast, but basically when I speak louder, you know, you see the amplitude go up. When I stop, it goes down. Hello, 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 hello. It goes up. There you go. So we basically wanted to slow that down. Our audio outlet would come out here, but we want this to come out here so we could hook it up. So what we're going to make is an outlet here. Control one outlet. Now, since we have two outlets, the leftmost one is the one over here. The right, the second one is automatically going to be in the right corner. So this is the outlet we just made. It basically spreads outlets evenly across left to right. Since we only have two, one's on the left corner, one's on the right corner. So this is our outlet that will go into our... Can we rename this from second now or, is, or are we going to lose our bus? <laughs> let's open it up let's give it an inlet and this number is going to come into here where it's going to be multiplied because we're getting a range of 0 to 1 Let's multiply it by like uh, 500. Now remember what this is going to is the transform translate to move all of that, that whole group of stuff there along its X axis. Okay. Now when we hook this up, Sometimes it's hard to see the outlets because when you put canvases down, it kind of hides them. Oh, uh-oh. We got a moving bus there. Let's grab this object and move it down here. Right about here. It's moving while I'm talking, so it's kind of tough. There we go. That's about right. So as I talk, it moves further over. Now it's scanning it like once every um, half a second with the amplitudes at. Maybe we could speed that up a little bit and see what happens here. Um, instead of being every half a second, see we're multiplying our amplitude by our sampling rate by 0.5. That means every 24,000 samples per second. If you're at 48,000, whatever your sampling rate is here, let's multiply that by 0.10. Make it smaller. A quicker amount of time. So now that's like 
10 times per second it's checking it and uh yeah that's what we're getting it's kind of like a level indicator going from down here up to here but if i stay quiet it doesn't move and then when i'm talking quietly it moves a bit and then talking loud it moves a lot more all right so there we go this is not intended to be a useful thing it's just the ideas that we've kind of gone through here in the elements in being able to make things um you can now see all right when we take data from audio and we integrate it with imagery we can make some stuff happen and we can make some interactive stuff happen but next week what we'll do is we'll finish through these tutorials in the help browser to finish uh, the rest of the basics and then we're going to make something that is going to be useful for um, a GUI for an audio thing. In fact, we're going to just refine this audio input and make it a little bit more useful for our future purposes throughout this course. And um, we're going to be using these data structures to do that, to give us some good GUI interaction um, and so forth. So in order to submit this to me, if you're in my classes, you need to zip up both of these files, bus and this, so that uh, the audio input file as well, so that they both do come through and I can open them up. And this is basically what I want to see for the assignment. And it should work. So test it out. Make sure your bus is moving. And if you have questions, please ask. Okay, folks, thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time where we will make something a little bit more useful. But at least this time, we did get something, and you can and you learn about all these different shapes and stuff you can make. Um, you can also, you'll see next time, work with images, and then there's even sprites, which are like frame by frame animations and all sorts of cool stuff. So I'll see you next time. Stay free and take care.